We are going to be in Acts chapter 2, if you want to grab a, a Bible or look it up, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Um, all of us, I'm sure, on our phones have a, a health app of one kind or another. These things tend to track your steps. Maybe they track your calorie intake or your weight and those kinds of things. And they're good as far as it goes. But we know that if we only look at those very small number of metrics, it's not always the, the best indication of our actual health. You can be getting the right number of steps, getting the right number of calories, being the same, the right kind of weight, and still be profoundly unhealthy. So we need much more than that, and the same is true when we think about our church health. Uh, we're at the beginning of a new ministry year, we look ahead to the next uh, several months, and we want to be healthy. Uh, we're thinking, how can we be as a, as a church healthy in the ways that God wants us to be? And just as with that app, you can, you can look at some obvious metrics, they may not be complete. We might look around and think, well, how's the giving going? Or what proportion of us are in small groups? Or how many programs are we running? Those are all good things, but you can have all of those things in place and still be an unhealthy church. So what should we be looking for as we seek to move forwards in health? And this passage in Acts, I think, will be a good place for us to look. Uh, Jesus, in, in the, the time this is, was written, Jesus has just ascended. As he promised, he's poured out his spirit on his people, so that as, as Barnabas was reminding us at the, the beginning of this service, Jesus can be with us. He really can be among us by his Spirit. And the impact of Jesus pouring out his Spirit has been dramatic. Uh, Peter has gone from being a coward to a street preacher. Uh, 3,000 people in, earlier in Acts chapter 2 have become followers of Jesus. The New Testament church as we know it bursts into existence. And this passage in Acts 2 verse 42 and following gives us a, a sketch of what that early Christian community was like. It shows us what it really looks like when Jesus gets into a group of people. Which, as we believe that Jesus really is among us, this is a sketch of what we are seeking to live ourselves into, to walk into as his people. So let me read the passage to us, Acts 2 verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon, came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is God's word. So four things I want us to notice about this community, four things to, to look for as evidence is that Jesus really is among us. The first is learning. The very first thing we're told by, by Luke who wrote this is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it reminds us that as we come to Jesus, we, we begin a lifelong process of learning. Uh, to, to be a disciple literally means to be a learner. Um, in many areas of life, you, you kind of do the learning part and then you put it to one side and you're done with it. Um, think about driving. You learn how to drive when you've then passed your test. If you're anything like me, not only do you now not learn anything else, you unlearn some of what you had learned to be a driver. But when it comes to, to being a follower of Jesus, we, we never finish learning and we never want to. And so this church we see was devoted to the apostles' teaching. A notice devoted to the apostles' teaching. These were the group that Jesus had specially authorized to give his words to the church. Their teaching was unique. It came with the authority of Jesus himself. And the great thing for us is it's been preserved for us in the New Testament. We don't need to worry about the fact that we weren't there, that we weren't listening. Um, all of their teaching has been recorded and collected for us in Scripture. So for us to be devoted to the apostles' teaching means we have to be learning from the Bible. 
Uh, it's why it's good when we, we meet together, we, we open the Bible, we learn from the Bible. It's why it's important that, that we, we weigh what we're being taught here to see if it really is biblical. And it's also why in Colossians 3 verse 16 it says we're to teach each other. It's why it's good to study the Bible with one another. The learning isn't just to be done from the, the preacher at the front, but we learn from each other as we open the scriptures together. But notice as well, not just that it's the apostles teaching that they, they learn from, but we're told they devoted themselves to this. That is one of the signs that, that Jesus really is among us, is that in our hearts we are devoted to this teaching. Now, I've heard people say over the years nice things about Emmanuel. One of the things I've, I've heard people say about this church is that there's, there's good Bible teaching. And in one sense, I, I hope that's true, but it's, it also kind of discourages me. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'd rather people said there's good Bible teaching here than that there's bad Bible teaching here. But it, it's, it's not enough, is it? What matters is not whether we're a church where there's good teaching, but whether we're a church where there's good learning. It's not enough that the word is, is being taught or that it's even being heard, but that our hearts are devoted to what the Bible is showing us. And there's, a, there's an obvious reason for that. They're devoted, in verse 42, to the apostles' teaching because they're devoted to Jesus. That's why we are devoted to this. That the more we grow in Jesus, the more we realize there is yet to discover in Jesus, the more there is to be wowed by in Jesus. And so we, we want to go further in. Um, I had to be away for a few months over the summer, but one of the things I was, I was glad to, to get to do back in the UK was to visit the Isle of Skye, which is, is my favorite place on the planet. And I remember the very first time I went there with a, a friend or two, we got there and we thought, let's just go for a quick drive after breakfast, do a bit of recce, and then we can figure out what we're going to do for the rest of the day. And we, we got in the car, started driving around, and we just kept on driving. We couldn't stop. Because every time we, we rounded a bend or crested a hill, there was yet another incredible view. And we just kept on going. And it, it's like that with Jesus as we... As we learn from the scriptures, we realize there is always yet more amazingness to see in Jesus. There's always more to be wowed by with Jesus. And it's, it's wonderful. It's why being a Christian is, is like, unlike so many other pleasures in life. There's, there's no law of diminishing returns when it gets to Jesus. He, he never disappoints us. He, he never becomes so familiar that he, he doesn't move us. There's always more to discover, and he gets better. Uh, when I first became a Christian, I was celebrating my, my spiritual birthday over the summer. I remember sitting there, August 1993, and I remember thinking, I need forgiveness from God. I, I realized I didn't know my creator, and that I was supposed to. And I knew that that was on me, and I, I knew I needed his forgiveness. And so for me, as I became a Christian, I remember thinking, okay, there's, there's the forgiveness there in Jesus, so I'm coming to Jesus for that forgiveness. Well, if I came for the forgiveness, I've stayed for the forgiver. Because we, we then begin to realize as we go on in the Christian life, the real prize wasn't the forgiveness, the real prize was Jesus. And the more we know Jesus, the more we want to get to know him even, even further. And so we're devoted to learning. Secondly, we're told about this church being marked by worship. We see this in a, a couple of different ways. In verse 42, we're, we're told that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, this was a church that was marked by prayer. That we see that in the, the following chapters. As you, as you read on in Acts, you realize that they prayed when there was opposition. They prayed when they needed guidance. They prayed when Peter was arrested. In the middle of the night, they would all pile around to someone's house to pray. It was something they were devoted to. And again, it makes sense. If we're, if we're learning more of Jesus, if we're being 
wowed by Jesus, we, we begin to realize just how much we need Jesus. It took me a long time to, to learn this as a Christian, but, but growth in the Christian life isn't needing Jesus less, it's needing Jesus more. The more we go on, the more we realize we need him, and therefore the more we need to just keep leaning on him and praying to him. And Jesus says that we can pray for anything in his name. He gives us that freedom. So it's not so much that we, we have to pray or that we're meant to pray, but that we get to pray now. We, we get to turn to him about anything that's going on in our lives. Which leads to another aspect of their, of their worship together, which we see at the beginning of verse 47. They were praising God. And we do. The more we, the more we learn of God, the more we lean on God, the more reasons we're given to praise him. It's hard to keep quiet among one another about how good God is when we're trusting in him. We, we always have reasons to take joy in him. Uh, we're told in verse 43 that, that awe came upon every soul. I'm sure a lot of that was because of these wonders and signs we, we see there in verse 43 being done through the apostles. I'm sure that awe was in, in response to all the ways in which God was working. There they were and, and lives were being changed. Prayers were being answered. Relationships were being healed. Communities were being transformed. The world was being upended. That is what happens when Jesus really is among a group of people. So it, it's not presumption for us to expect this coming ministry year to be a year of, of experiencing ongoing miracle. As we see God at work among us, there's a sense of spiritual reality. We, we realize Christianity isn't just a nice idea in theory, but we see it. It's real to us. And there's something else that life of worship does to us. As we pray together, as we praise God together, we, we actually become closer to one another. And so the third mark of this healthy church here in Acts chapter 2 is partnership. Again, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Now, we tend to think the word fellowship is, you know, if you have at least two Christians in the presence of coffee, there you have fellowship. But the word fellowship in, in the, the original text simply meant partnership. It was, it was the word you would use if you were going into business with someone. Um, you were partners in the same venture. You were committed to the same thing. And so the same is true of us as Christians. We, we now have a stake in one another. We're in this thing together. We're, we're bound up with one another. And we see that partnership at work. We see it in how they, they shared their time with each other. So verse 44, we're told that all who believed were together. That they hung out a lot. In verse 46, they, they met day by day in the, in the temple. They, they seemed to be meeting on a daily basis. Now, it was the time of Pentecost, so it's a bit like when school's out and it's the holiday, so they would have had more time. But even so, their reflex was to spend time with one another. Uh, we see them eating together a lot. Twice we're told they broke bread. I'm sure that's a, a reference to sharing the Lord's Supper, which we will be doing in just a few moments' time, but I'm sure it also means they were actually sharing meals together. And so it is with us. As we, as we go on in Jesus, we, our instinct should be to be spending time together, to be sharing meals together. It, it's a, a natural expression of our partnership. Uh, similarly, we see they didn't just share their time, they, they shared their possessions. So verse 44, we're told, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, we mustn't misunderstand. It's not that no one had their own things. 
Um, in verse 45, they have their own possessions. In verse 46, they have their own homes. What we're seeing here isn't some forced collectivism. What we're seeing is radical generosity. They were eager to share what they had in order to meet any needs that arose among them. And it really was radical. They weren't just sort of sharing little bits of, of loose change here. We, we go on and see in chapter 5 that people were selling land and giving the, the, the proceeds to the church to help meet people's needs. And land in those days, that was your capital. That was like kind of handing over the, the contents of your bank account. It was radical generosity. And no doubt it, it flowed out of the fact that they had this time together. They, they were in each other's lives enough to know what each other's needs were. And again, that should be something that we, we long to experience as we go into this ministry year. And it might mean for some of us that we, we should be a bit more open about our needs. All of us have needs. And this is meant to be a community where we can share those needs. By, by letting someone else know about needs you have, you're actually serving that other person. And similarly, we need to make sure that, that we're all people who are, are going to be approachable and safe for other people to share their needs with us. But that is part of what it means to have this sense of fellowship and partnership. And it, it happens because Jesus is among us. Jesus does this to us. The reason we have fellowship with one another is because we have fellowship with him. The reason we feel so deeply bound to one another is because we are so deeply bound to him. Sometimes I think we, we don't realize how deeply connected Jesus is with his people. Now, the most common way to describe a, a follower of Jesus in the New Testament isn't to describe them as a Christian, but to describe them as someone who is in Christ. We're united to Jesus. That the communion that we're going to be taking in a, in a few minutes' time is, is an expression of that. We don't just look at the, the elements from, from afar. We, we appropriate them. We take them in. We, we become united to them. It's a, a picture of our unity with Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul had to learn about this the hard way when he was, before he was converted and he was persecuting the church. Jesus himself confronted him. And he said to Paul, not, why are you persecuting my church? Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? That's how closely Jesus identifies with his people. And if Jesus is that connected to me and Jesus is that connected to you, we become connected to one another. And so there is partnership. That the presence of Jesus among us is a unique social adhesive. It does something to a group of people nothing else can do. It knits us together at the very deepest level. And we become aware more and more of a sense of partnership among us. And then the final thing we see here is, is growth. Um, have a look at verse 47. We're told that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Just imagine that, that people were coming to Jesus for the first time daily. I'm sure it was an administrative headache trying to sort of create groups and communities and congregations and churches for, for all of these new believers, but what a, wonderful, what a wonderful challenge to have. That's something we would long to see more of moving into this new ministry year. Well, there's a couple of things I think Luke wants us to see about this growth that I'm sure will encourage us. The first is that God is the one who does the growing. The Lord added to their number. God did this. For any growth, we depend entirely on him. It's interesting, as you read through the book of Acts, Luke rarely mentions evangelism. And we know that the Christians were sharing their faith and being active in doing so, but the language Luke constantly uses is, is he says things like, you know, the word of God continued to grow there. 
God is the one who does the growing. He is the agent of growth here. And so we mustn't go into this year thinking, well, as long as we get our systems fine-tuned and in place, you know, get these, these groups kind of fixed up and everything sort of set up, then revival will be assured. No, God is the one who gives growth. This is his church. This is his work. But the other thing I think Luke is, is trying to show us here is that a church like this will grow. Now, I don't think this passage is, is meant to suggest that every single church will only ever always be growing all the time. Uh, we know a bit later on in Acts, as, as persecution breaks out, some of the believers have to scatter. I'm, I'm sure the church actually took a bit of a hit. But nevertheless, I, I, the, we're given reason in the New Testament to, to be optimistic. Jesus says, I will build my church. And he will. Now, we read in Isaiah 9 that of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And I think part of what Luke is showing us in this passage is that this kind of church where there is this kind of devotion to learning, this eagerness to, to, to know more and more of Jesus, where there's this kind of, of worship, a sense of spiritual reality, this kind of partnership where we are genuinely caring for one another and sacrificially giving for one another, all of those things will be non-ignorable to the world around us. Uh, there will be opposition. Uh, they were about to, to find very severe opposition in this part of Acts. That, that's to be expected, but there will also be times when, verse 47, we find favor with people. Sometimes those two things happen at the same time. This is what happens when Jesus gets into a group of people. So four things to, to look for, to lean into, to pray for more of as we get cracking this year. We, we want to be a church where there is learning. We want to keep being wowed by Jesus. A church where there's worship, where we, we can't help but be in awe of what God is doing among us. A church where there's a, a felt sense of partnership, a sense of being in this thing together. And then by God's grace and by his means that there might be growth as more people come to know Jesus. In other words, and as we, as we frequently put it, we want Jesus, community, and mission. That is what he's calling us to here. So let me pray for us as we prepare to receive communion as well. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we thank you that as we were reminded at the beginning of our time together, Jesus, he really is among us. And so this is not simply a human gathering of people. This is not just a, a human group. But Jesus is here. Jesus is present in our life together. And we pray, therefore, Lord, that we would be a church that is marked by these things, that we would be devoted to the apostles' teaching, that we would always be hungry to know more of Jesus. We pray that we'd be a church that, that worships Jesus, that is in awe of who he is and, and what he does among us, a church where there is a sense of partnership, where we feel so bound together because we're bound to Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would add to our number those who are being saved. Father, please use the ministry of this church to draw people to Jesus. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. Let's continue to prepare for communion.